So the first provision, the provision in basically every agreement, is an entire agreement clause or called a merger clause or integration clause. So the purpose is, and again, I always view it as if a third party, if we're in a dispute later, that's what is the purpose of the contract unless there's a dispute. Uh, if we're in a dispute later, and we have to bring a third party in, uh, arbiter, uh, fact finder, judge, jury, and they're looking at the contract, what are they going to do with it? So this provision, the purpose is, let's spell out to somebody who has to read our contract, the scope of the contract. And I don't mean scope from like a, a purpose standpoint, but what are all the pieces that should fit into the contract? So for this provision, just an example, this agreement and all exhibits and schedules constitute the entire agreement, supersedes everything else. Uh, exhibits and schedules are incorporated into the agreement as I've set forth in their entirety. So what are we doing here? In many ways, we are trying to do the old, uh, the old parole evidence rule which I know is just nobody's favorite topic at all. But we're saying everything that happened before today's date when we signed this contract, forget about it. Uh, so if you, and this is, gonna have, this is gonna have important implications, if you're doing a contract after your company has had all these sales presentations and all the normal uh, stuff that a, a vendor or service provider might provide to you, uh, and all those PowerPoints and everything about how great this thing is going to be, and all the separate documentation. If those presentations and that documentation and those representations and warranties and all of those other things aren't incorporated into your agreement, they, it's like they don't exist anymore. So what we are telling the court is, on today's date, we all decided that this piece of paper is going to tell you what our contract, uh, what is involved with our contract. And that's it. So all negotiations, preliminary agreements, prior or contemporaneous discussions and understandings, they're superseded, now it's just a piece of paper. So when you're working with your internal clients, for those of you in-house, and you're talking to the business and they don't understand why you're spending so much time with the contract, and they don't understand that the things that they had all been talking about from a sales perspective, um, that they're enforceable anymore. Now it's just a contract. That can help tell them. So the provision in the agreement is helpful in that it is definitely a factual situation whether or not a court is going to look at extrinsic evidence, again, the horrible term. Um, to use the parole evidence rule. And if you have a merger agreement, a merger provision, entire agreement provision like this, they are going to, it's gonna be more likely than not that an extraneous document is incorporated. So important things to think about one, everything that, anything that you want that's important that happened before this document is entered into, reference it, get in the agreement somehow, exhibit schedules, um, web links, as long as you can keep track of what the documents were from from the get-go, get them in here. If there are other, if there are prior agreements that are kind of ancillary or similar to this, uh, call out that those survived the agreement and that they aren't being terminated. Just make clear what's going on. And again, you can always, remember the parole evidence rule basics says that at this point in time, you can put all of your thoughts and uh, everything you want in the agreement in the agreement at this time, but you can change it later. So this really is just happening from this time and back. Should I run the chat button or are we all good? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Chris. No waiver or modifications in writing. Uh, this is really, there's, there's really two things going on here. The first is the no waiver provision. So that is about, I don't know, two thirds of the provision. 
a failure delay on part of party exercising right, remedy, etc., uh, doesn't preclude them exercising that right in the future. And we want it to be in writing and signed. And the bottom third is the waiver again, where it's, if we waive now, it's just for that specific time. Don't come complaining to us. Um, and it doesn't mean we've waived everything. Most common, uh, this comes up most frequently, you can imagine, in a lender arrangement. It's in every agreement, again, because it's a boilerplate, but um, especially in a lending arrangement. What, you, what, you, what you're trying to do is make sure that the court doesn't say, well, you allowed this transfer, you allowed, let's say there's a loan covenant, you allowed uh, the borrower to breach a loan covenant in this instance. And since you said it was okay that time, they don't have to follow that loan covenant every time in the future. That's obviously, well, that is almost always never the intent of the lender. Uh, more often than not, they are, they might take some money, uh, change some other parameters, but they want that covenant to exist again. They also don't want some sort of ancillary action like um, uh, separately, but say uh, a, a party to your agreement breaches. You don't want a salesperson or a non-lawyer on your side shooting an email over to your vendor or service provider, the third party, and saying, "Oh, that's fine. We, you know, we don't, uh, we don't need to worry about that." So you have a couple issues there. One is who's authorized to waive a provision in the agreement. They shoot an email over, it actually is in writing for almost all purposes for e-sign and UEDA and all that fun stuff. So, um, you know, you still have that writing issue. The, if the lawyer isn't doing it, it's probably not going to be clear enough that uh, whether you are just waiving it in this particular provision or if you basically say, yeah, we know you were supposed to provide that person to us for six months, it's okay that you didn't. Well, does that mean we were just we can wait the two weeks that you were missing, or we do, do we not need that person anymore? Um, and then probably the biggest issue in the middle of it is we don't want anyone to be able to amend this agreement unless it's in a writing signed by the party. Unfortunately for us, that provision, at least under Iowa law, is probably not enforceable. Because in Iowa law, you, again, every, all of this will revolve around facts, so a lot of it is just self-serving. But in Iowa, they're going to say, well, did the parties intend to amend the agreement going forward? And that doesn't have to be in writing. You've got your contract. Again, that is parole evidence rule. That just deals with putting everything on paper that happened in the past until today's date. It doesn't deal with what the parties might have decided to do in the future. So sometimes these modifications in writing, these amendment provisions will say things like, and the agreement cannot be changed through the course of dealing, course of performance, etc." More likely than not, a, con a, a court is going to look at that and say, well, that's not true. If you guys decide to have this agreement in writing and you decide together that you're going to go do something else and you do that for six months, um, either the contract's amended or we're going to say from an equity standpoint, you can't complain about that anymore. You've essentially waived that issue or you're stopped because of uh, detrimental reliance or whatever. So the, the provision in here that says, uh, amendments can only be in writing. It's probably not enforceable, but as a contract attorney, you're always you're just always so hopeful that that might happen. That a court might say it can't be amended, so that contractual term that you wanted to survive hasn't been waived. So we put it in there anyway. Um, 
Okay, so just to note, when you're putting a provision in here that's not likely enforceable, uh, again, it doesn't mean you shouldn't have it in there, but I always have a conversation with your client about that. Um, if, there, if there are any issues in your agreement where you think the provision is ambiguous or pushes the law, um, you know, I think it could be in there. But just make sure it is brought up to the client and it becomes a business decision. Uh, if they want to, example, for example, have a non-compete that isn't dealing with the sale of business and they want to put in there that it survives for three years, and, I mean, we can still scrim in that, but you should have the conversation that they're probably not going to get the enforcement of that condition. Okay, so severability is the next provision. Uh, basically, for the most part, if you remember exchange of promises and all this fun stuff, for the most part, you want an agreement to be considered an integrated whole so that when you're looking at the provision, you're not, you know, you can imagine there are times when if a court struck one provision, you would lose all of your, everything that was important to you in the contract would be brushed aside. If that was brushed aside, then just by striking that one provision, now you might as well not even have the contract. So because of that, you got into these, um, the integration and that sort of case law where, well, is this exchange of promises so important to the agreement that it can't be stricken? Um, otherwise, the agreement fails of its essential purpose? Or is this the type of provision where the court can kind of take it out and maybe it changes things up a little bit, but um, you know the parties are still getting the benefit of the bargain? In Iowa and other states, we're blue lining states. So we talk about, I mean, the, the most common thing I can think of is uh, a provision in the non competition agreement that is unenforceable because of the scope of coverage, whether it's from geographic area um, or the time frame it covers or the types of business it covers. In those instances, I mean, the employer obviously wants to be able to push the envelope without knowing that a court is going to just delete the provision from the contract um, if, it, if we went too far, if we did the three years or whatever. So Iowa and other states have, uh, not all of the other states, are blue lining states, but for our purposes, especially Iowa. And they will go in and essentially, well, the non compete provision looks okay, but it says three years, it only should be one. We will change three to one, and we will enforce the provision to that extent. Um, that obviously helps save uh, the, the employer's benefit of the bargain, while at the same time, the employee isn't, I don't know, I don't know what you call that, but you're not getting a windfall by being able to just walk away from the company without any non-compete. When clearly, if there's a non-compete provision in here, it was the party's intent that they would be bound by the non-compete. So the court, the severability provision that's the example in front of you talks about if there's anything in here that's not... Um, if there's anything in here that's not enforceable or it's illegal or would be void, don't throw away the contract. Don't throw away that provision. Instead, go in a blue line and change it up. And it says, enforce it to enforce everything else to the rest of the contract. The court, again, will probably look at their integration doctrine and say, well, I mean, you can imagine, like, well, we decided that the provision on uh, price wasn't correct. So we're just deleting that there's any payment. 
And that's an absurd example, but shows you that there are certain provisions in the contract that you can't really do that. So the court isn't going to use this provision to take out those most meaningful ones, uh, but they will, they will, you know, blue line in instances where you can save provisions in the contract. Essentially, um, there are. You might have seen a different variety of this provision in the contract. Sometimes the first sentence is pretty common, so. Um, the rest of the provisions are still enforceable. You see that. But sometimes instead of the blue lighting, you see if anything's held illegal, invalid, and enforceable, then the parties will get together and renegotiate the provision or the remainder of the agreement to, uh, so that the parties basically get the benefit of the bargain that they were initially planning on getting. So that in some ways can that can in some ways can feel more fair. Uh, but obviously you are opening up the contract to renegotiation at that point. And you're probably arguing with the third party about whether or not that provision's unenforceable or that invalid or illegal in the first place. Um, again you can certainly do that. I prefer this provision where if it ever gets in front of a court, I know what they're going to do from a blue lining perspective because I can always renegotiate the deal and we can always, uh, as between parties, we can always come up with something else. Instead of doing that, if it's illegal, unenforceable, and valid, we'll renegotiate. You might consider like a, a change of law provision. It's more narrowly tailored. So um, if there's a change, in law that materially, these are, you know, these are fuzzy words, but materially affects the party's rights after, after, the, after the contract has been entered into, or a change of enforcement policy, uh, things along that, along those lines, so you have more, more of a fence around what that change looks like, then the parties will sit down and try to negotiate something for a little while. You might consider that because then it's a little bit more tailored than if anything's just held illegal. Because, you know, if a change in law happens, it's great. If it's something one of the parties should have already known they shouldn't have been able to do in the first place, uh, that's a little bit different scenario. Um, so the when we were talking about, I just wanted to read one of the eight circuits pieces, uh, not all of it, but when we talk about the blue lining versus the integration piece, the Eighth Circuit has said under Iowa law, the, and the whole agreement isn't going to be invalidated um, unless taking that provision out or taking out the provision so much that it, the arrangement just essentially falls apart. Consent to jurisdiction. So the purpose, uh, maybe somewhat obvious, is to ensure that the location of any litigation that might arise from the contract is in the location you want. Uh, we do that in a few different steps in this provision. The first is we want the party, the other party, to irrevocably submit to the exclusive jurisdiction of Port Nile. Um, and we want them to agree that all claims basically rising out of related to this agreement are going to come in Iowa. And there's probably more federal and state case law around a provision like this than some of the other ones. Uh, simply because obviously now we're talking about constitutional rights. Uh, when do you have personal jurisdiction over third parties? The nice thing is, in general, parties can contract to um, 
to go around what otherwise would be a constitutional saying that we don't have personal jurisdiction. So some of the important parts have come up in uh, Republic, Republic Credit Corp. And there are a couple of those in the Southern District of Iowa. And then recently the Atlantic Marine case, um, I guess not that recent, December 2013, which all support the all support the enforcement of these provisions. So what do you want to do? Well, again, it's kind of factual, but you can do self-serving things. One is you don't want a party later to be able to say it was non-exclusive versus exclusive. So you don't want to just reach out for personal jurisdiction and say, well, we have you now. But that doesn't mean that they can't file a claim uh, in a different court. So you want to be able to say it's exclusive jurisdiction. They can only file claims in our specific court. Uh, you need to have federal and state because obviously, as between those two courts, uh, some have jurisdiction. The federal might have jurisdiction, the state may not. Uh, but at least you can get it in Iowa, which you know helps with expenses of counsel, expenses of take where you want your witnesses to be, experts, all that. You don't want that uh, in a cost-effective home court. You don't want them to be able to complain later that even though they've submitted to the jurisdiction, that it's an inconvenient forum, forum non-convenient uh, later, and that now, despite the fact that we've entered into the contract, there are these facts outside that exist uh, that makes it, it just so ineffective for us that now it needs to be in California or something like that. And then finally, a little bit uh, overkill, but you don't want them to be able to bring an action anywhere else. And in the Atlantic Marine case, if you're familiar with it, it's, a lot of it is civil procedure things that I don't understand. But it talks about the types of ways that you want to bring, if an action is started and you have a consent to jurisdiction provision in your contract and the action is started in a jurisdiction that is not the one listed in your contract, um, the rules and procedure to follow to bring that over to the, to the uh, form you want. And the Atlantic Marine case does a pretty good job of going through why these are enforceable, how parties can contract to it, um, just making it very clear. I believe they call them, they call it forum selection clause in there, in that case. So you might call it a forum selection instead of a consent to jurisdiction. Uh, but it walks through the types of things that uh, make your provision enforceable. Just like anything else, where somebody is kind of waving a right, or uh, there's some constitutionality involved in it, you always want to make sure it is uh, uh, obvious, if I'm getting the correct word, but uh, you, you want to make it stand out in the agreement. So you will often see the consent to jurisdiction provision, governing law, waiver of jury trial, all of those in all caps, or in bold, or italics, uh, towards the end of the contract, near the signature page, so that the defendant can later cannot say, uh, well, I didn't see that provision, that was just boilerplate, and as you know, of course, you don't need to enforce boilerplate all the time, because uh, it might be hidden in there. You do have to worry about that sometimes, because for non-sophisticated, uh, for people who are not, not sophisticated, who are signing things, you need to be add more emphasis, just make abundantly clear that the consent to jurisdiction provision is there. So whatever you can do uh, to help that. Some folks in our office go so far as to having folks uh, initial a provision, initial beside a provision like this, uh, or waiver of jury trial, arbitration provision, have the people uh, initial beside an arbitration provision so they cannot um, claim later that they didn't see it and they can bring an action anywhere else. That is great if you have very good processes in place to ensure that it happens. Obviously what would be worse 
is to have a little blank line for their initial beside the provision and no initial there when you're trying to um, enforce the contract later. So that if you really if you know that every single time that whoever is having the contract signed will be sure to get that initial, then that is a very good way to show the court uh, that this person knew the provision. If you think that might not happen, then bold, uh, bold case type, capital type, near the end of the contract, near the signature page. That that uh, that is certainly helps it to be enforceable. Waiver of jury trial. Uh, okay, obviously we don't want to have a jury in our trial. That is the purpose of the provision. Whether or not to include this provision in a contract for you or your client uh, is definitely a factual situation. I would say that we generally recommend to our clients, generally to recommend to our clients to have this type of provision in your contract, to have it, again, like we were talking about the consent to jurisdiction, have it right near the signature page. So it's right, it's directly above the signature, so there can be no confusion. This is obviously a constitutional right, so it needs to be voluntary and irrevocable and obvious, and there can be no um, no question in the court's mind, in the fact finder's mind, that the person who signed the agreement knew what they were doing when they signed the agreement with this provision in it. So you don't want it hidden someplace. You don't want it in the middle of your contract. You don't want it in the middle of four pages of capitalized text. Um, you want it stand by itself in a very obvious way. Now the reason we, uh, as a firm, generally recommend it is usually we, as a firm, uh, at Nymaster, our clients are usually all these, you know, big, bad, awful companies, right? So we think for two reasons that having a provision in your agreement is helpful for big, bad, awful companies. One is, you know, whether it's an insurance company, financial services company, with which I'm sure many of you work for. Uh, or represent with financial services just being uh, so important in Des Moines and in Iowa. If you have a jury there, even though juries in Iowa are uh, pretty good, really, I think, um, if you have a jury there and it's an insurance company versus, you know, little guy, a juror's sympathy is obviously going to be with the, the little guy versus the company. Almost always. Second is, in general, we would say we would rather have a judge interpreting the, uh, the provisions of our contract, which can be, depending on what the deal is, extremely complex, versus having eight jurors, or however many there are for civil case, looking at the terms of the contract. Because this is not, even though the judges themselves, the district court, uh, appellate court, um, usually aren't doing contract law issues, we still say, you know, they're, they're trained as lawyers, they're in a better position than a, a group of uh, lay people, I guess, to interpret the contract in the way that it should be interpreted and apply the law to the contract as opposed to manipulating the words to, to help the, the facts of the case. So if you look in here, uh, each of the parties irre irrevocably waive a right to trial by jury in any action seen or counterclaim, however so arising, uh, out, arising out of or relating to this agreement or the actions of the parties. So we want it to touch everything. We don't want uh, a case to be brought over here that was kind of tangential to the agreement, but we'll say, well, we're suing over here, so it's not a contractual claim, so the jury trial wasn't waived for that. We really want everything brought in. Wow. And again, but there are there are certainly times when we, as a as a firm or as an attorney, tell my client, you know, here's where the waiver of jury trial provision is. This is why we usually do it. But in your in your circumstance, uh, we would say don't have it in there because in the case that comes up, maybe it's like a, a consultant, uh, a small consulting agreement. So now they are adverse to 
uh, these larger companies. Well, in that instance, you might get a certain um, benefit from having a jury, and we can always make that decision uh, at the time. So, uh, I'm going to answer a question here in a second. So the question is, uh, have I seen a severability clause that says the severed contract will be like it's articles or material contract, like a loan agreement? Um, yes, I have. I would say I've seen it more frequently with the material financial hardship to a party. Uh, see those, you know, that would be not a loan agreement, that would be more like a um, some sort of vendor or service provider contract. And with respect to the material financial hardship, if you are, if your company is the one that will be receiving the services, more likely than not, you don't want a provision like that in there because the you know, you're always going to be paying money. So it's pretty hard to say a material financial hardship has occurred to you as the company that's just paying money when you had agreed to pay money in the first place. It'd be pretty hard to get that enforced. So it's really going to be a change in law, um, a change be reasonable to do a change in scope, but a regulatory requirement and things like that would now require the other company to spend more money. So what you don't want to do is have a material financial hardship provision basically allow the third party to say, well, this was a bad deal for us, and now I want to renegotiate it. This was bad. Um, the second part, which was, have you seen a severability provision that is fine as long as the, basically I think the, the change in the contract would require them to uh, violate a term of their articles or a material contract. I haven't seen that one as much. Um, I think that would that'd be another one to me that would be good for like a change in law type provision because I'm just having a little bit, I'm trying to think of when blue lining might make a company, you know, the articles basically are, are going to have, uh, you know, your required amount of stock, uh, the purpose of your entity around the power and, and that sort of thing. So I hope, I'm trying to think of when blue lining might affect your, the power you have for your company. Uh, so I just don't see that one as much. Um, and I'm trying to think of how blue line might, hopefully blue line in the contract wouldn't make you be in breach of, a, of another contract of yours. Uh, but again, I don't see that one as much for the financial hardship that I do see. So thank you for the question. Uh, if you have any others, please do ask them. So I'm not gonna read to you any case law on the waiver of jury trial, uh, but Voluntary knowing, as is usual, you can go to a Judge Bennett opinion to get a very, very long, uh, detailed discussion about uh, about the waiver of jury trial provision. So that's that's in cooperative financial, and that's where the, they basically survey the case law and summarize a number of factors that, that courts look at. So if you ever want to take a look at why they're enforceable, how they're enforceable. Um, you can go to that, to that cooperative financial case. Governing law. Uh, this is one of those interesting provisions because, I don't know, as a practitioner in Iowa, practitioner in Iowa uh, I know about, I know in depth probably, well, I know in depth about Iowa law. I know pretty well about Delaware law, uh, 
and then I have feelings about other states' laws, but whether or not a specific provision in a contract would be interpreted uh, to my client's benefit versus another client's benefit versus the other party's benefit in a particular situation um, is usually an unknown unless the client has given us the go-ahead to, to research that issue. So it is, a, these are very frequently uh, negotiated provisions but whether or not it benefits your client in the long run will be hard to know because uh, the governing law and the jurisdiction, importantly, don't have to align. Uh, you can certainly have a governing law provision that talks about applying the laws of the state of New York, but still having the exclusive jurisdiction be in Iowa. Uh, I'm sure between Iowa Council and maybe consulting with New York Council or just researching under New York law, to be able to figure out what the, how the case is to be interpreted, provision is to be interpreted in that situation. So the background is, uh, whether it's restatement second of contracts, 187 or 188, basically the state of Iowa, I can get you a, will not, um, has said, yes, governing law, great, you guys, can contractually agree to it, except in certain circumstances. Uh, but the circumstances aren't such that you wouldn't just agree. You, there's no reason you wouldn't put it in your contract. So as a practitioner in Iowa and clients in Iowa, we always shoot to have a uh, state of Iowa be the governing law. Almost always our second choice is New York. And Usually the question uh, I get is, well, why New York and why not Delaware law? For, from a corporate practitioner standpoint, uh, Delaware law is, we'd say, is, is great and well settled on corporate governance structures, uh, internal governance matters. Uh, anytime Iowa law is silent on those internal governance matters or shareholder disputes, et cetera, uh, our courts are almost always looking to Delaware to see how they are handling it and often are you know, bringing Delaware law over. And but that's for a governance standpoint. From an from a interpretation of contract, contractual standpoint, the opinion is Delaware law isn't actually any better than any other law. And they have some un trying to think of the one the one that comes to mind most quickly is their interpretation of um, damages provisions and statute of limitations I believe don't quote me on this I will lie plus I gave you the disclaimer earlier I believe you get statute of some weird statute of limitations sometimes on contractual claims where where when we're used to like a five or 10 year statute of limitations, you might get something like a 30 year statute of limitations in Delaware sometimes. Not, and nobody's really thinking a contract should uh, survive past its uh, termination date that long. So that's why I usually pick New York over Delaware, uh, just has some good settled law on it. And it's actually relatively neutral from a contract interpretation standpoint. So you can feel reasonably comfortable that if you uh, go with New York law, you're not gonna get some weird flyer that you wouldn't be used to in, a, in Iowa. I mentioned four jurisdictions. It's because, you know, everything between Iowa and New York, Delaware, and the rest of the country, uh, for the most part, unless there's a few things in Illinois or something like that, you might be okay. We always push it really hard against California law because that just has, again, we're usually representing companies and they just have so many goofy laws, especially in the employment area. Uh, and by goofy, I mean, they I won't say they're fair or unfair, but they are not necessarily what a company would think about uh, enforceability in an, entering into a contract. So. Unfortunately, there are lots of companies with lots and lots of leverage that live out in California, 
and they want to have California govern and you might not be able to do anything about it, um, but that, you know, that's a fight that might be worth having a little bit. Anti-assignment clause. Uh, generally, when you enter into a contract with a third party, uh, it's important to you that you know who the third party is. Uh, for a service provider agreement, maybe you've got a particular relationship with the vendor, uh, or for whatever reason, these are the people you want to do business with. On the flip side, uh, it's pretty obvious that just Agglomeration, acquisitions, private equity, venture capital, service providers these days absolutely want as much of an unrestricted right to sell their companies as they can possibly get from the people to whom they're providing service. Because in the middle of an acquisition, depending on the form of acquisition, it can be very difficult to go out and get 800 consents or a number of consents. And especially when you're doing venture cap or private equity and you know the company is only going to be owned uh, for three to five to seven years, they don't want to have to go through the ribbon roll every time as they're rolling companies up. So that is the natural tension. If you're entering into software contracts with folks, you're going to be dealing with that issue. So I guess there's three things to note. One is what you're prohibiting is very specific in the, in the agreement. In the pr example that's shown here, it talks about assignment. No assignment, no delegation, no subcontracting. Uh, if you just had an anti-delegation provision, meaning the service provider can't delegate the uh, provision of services to you, doesn't mean they couldn't assign the contract, the benefit of the contract to the party. That's unusual. We usually use the anti-assignment language. Anti-assignment, it'd be pretty hard, though, to say that an anti-assignment provision would necessarily prohibit a subcontract unless you call that out uh, pretty clearly. Two, um, if, if you just talk about assignment, that is the actual transfer of the contract like as an asset from one party to another, uh, a transfer as part of a merger may or may not be considered that. Uh, the Iowa actually isn't completely settled on whether that would happen. Uh, whether if you merge your company into another company, that the transfer of the assets that occurs statutorily uh, by operation of law, whether that would be considered an assignment. I think the better answer is yes, it would, uh, but you don't want to take that. Um, you, you don't want to take that risk. And then what this, agree what this provision clearly is not is a change in control provision which would say, you know, if your shareholders swap out of the company, the agreement itself still needs, you still need consent. Um, in those instances, a stock sale would not trip over an anti-assignment clause. Uh, if somebody were to, you know, just sell 52% of their company, there's no chance, that's a change in control, it's not an assignment. So you have to think about what do I really want to accomplish with this provision? And in some instances, a change in control or an assignment or allowing subcontracting doesn't bother you. So, you know, just get what's important for you for that specific deal. If those things are important to you, then the last sentence is important to you uh, because you want that assignment to be null and void. If you think about uh, what has happened when you might be talking about this provision. So you didn't want an assignment to occur. An assignment has occurred. Now you're going to the court and you want a remedy. And you want, maybe it's impractical, but you may want to say, I don't want the agreement to go to these Yahoo's. I want the original person with whom I contracted to be the one to provide me service. If you don't have a provision in here that says the assignment is null and void, what the court might say is, well, the agreement was assigned, nothing we can do about it now, 
uh, it breached the agreement, it breached that provision, and since it is a breach, we will give you monetary damages. And then the court will probably go on to say, and these guys are just fine with what they're doing right now, even though you might have anxiety about it, and it might be much worse later. Uh, so here's five bucks. Or here's 20 bucks because we'll teach them not to do that again. So having a provision here that says it's null and void means the assignment never occurred. And now it's more likely that you can get specific performance than just monetary damages for your uh, for their breach of this provision. And then finally, another provision that we throw in here because you know it might help. It, you know, throwing it in here with, with the rest of the facts, it might help. Is especially if we are the big bad company and there's the little guy on the other side and the little guy might be seen as not sophisticated um, or if the little guy's a company you know, just doesn't have the financial wherewithal, everything else. We want to overcome the, the old contractual case law that whoever messed up in the agreement you know, whoever drafted the agreement, any issues with the agreement, we're going to hold against them. Uh, we don't, as the, people, as the people drafting the contract more often than not, we don't want any the court simply to interpret it against us because we drafted the contract. This makes a lot of sense since a lot of contracts are heavily negotiated um, and the parties really have uh, spent a lot of time uh, both, you know, both are really responsible for the contract, for its preparation. But there's sometimes where we put this provision in there and nothing really happens to the contract. Even though the party with whom we're dealing was quite sophisticated, uh, they just, you know, they wanted the deal, so it's not negotiated. The, a, a court, again, is really going to look at the facts of the case, see whether it was uh, prepared by one party versus the other. And this provision, they could just ignore it. Um, but it'd be nice to have it in there if that came up and if they wanted to include that in the facts. So better safe than sorry. And again, we get, you know, we get paid by the word. So it's nice to have it in there. Um, sometimes you see longer provisions of this, especially settlements, uh, releases, waivers, where it talks about you have this provision, but you also talk about a person having consulted with counsel, having sufficient time, having any legal notices required about the amount of time they have to revoke or how many days they've had to look at release. So I would kind of put all those things in the same type of provision as a construction provision. So that is it. Um, I think we have a couple minutes. I'm not sure if this clock is correct. Two minutes. Uh, if you, as always, uh, my email is on the website, so you can always, if you didn't feel comfortable or didn't want to uh, ask questions during the presentation, feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer those questions. 